Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's GTCS webinar. Today's webinar is Transforming the Emotional Load, Making Transitions, presented by Claire Lavelle, Managing Director of the Hive of Wellbeing, with Sharon Smith, Senior Education Manager at GTC Scotland. I'm Fraser Shand, and I work at GTCS as Digital Communications and Events Coordinator. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface, which you'll see now in the PowerPoint slide. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default, but if you would prefer to join in over the phone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed. You can submit questions by typing these into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send these questions in at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If there are any questions we don't get around to answering today, we plan to publish a Q&A on our website soon. You can also use this questions pane to raise any technical issues you have, and we will do the best we can to find a solution for you. Like many of you, we are also adjusting to new technology and the perils of home internet connections, so please bear with us should we encounter any difficulties during the webinar tonight. <coughs> materials from tonight's webinar and a recording will be available on our Health and Wellbeing Hub by tomorrow afternoon. Just search Health and Wellbeing GTCS on Google to find the resource. I would now like to introduce Sharon Smith to introduce tonight's webinar. Thank you, Fraser. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharon Smith, and I'm a Senior Education Officer at the General Teaching Council for Scotland. And I've been working alongside Claire to bring you all her wellbeing webinars during lockdown. I've got to say that when we planned for this webinar, we were un unaware of the Scottish Government's timeline for teachers returning to schools. And personally, I think this webinar has arrived in a very timely fashion. For those of you who previously listened to, to Claire's webinars, you will know that our approach has been extremely reassuring. She discusses the feelings we may all be experiencing as we continue the lockdown journey. Making the transition back into school will not be the same for everyone. And Claire today will take us through some discussions and supports to help us manage. I promise you Claire's webinar, Transforming the Emotional Load, Making the Transition, will tick off all of the boxes for you today. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Claire, the Director of the Hive of Wellbeing, to begin today's webinar. Thanks so much, Sharon, and thank you to Fraser and GTCS yet again for having me um, speak to you today. And thank you also to all of our participants joining us today in the webinar. I'm very grateful to you for your time out at this time, at a very busy time. Um, as always, I ask you or invite you to have a notepad with you to maybe write down anything that occurs to you during the webinar, anything that comes up for you, and also to observe any of your own thoughts and feelings as we go through this. Um, I'm aware that as I go through some of this today, I am going to say some things that you have had thoughts about already. You'll not find me maybe something very new in what I say, but what you might find is are, are ideas that resonate with you and also that reassure you as you move towards the return to the workplace. And I want to make that really emphatic that it's about a return to the workplaces and the settings as opposed to a return to work because you've been working probably harder than you've ever worked before during this time. I'm also aware that some of the things I talk about may not resonate with you, but that's OK too. It's just about observing what comes up for us as we go through this. And as Sharon says, there'll be time at the end for some questions. So I want to start with a quote, and the quote today is from someone that I've quoted before. I'm an African-American civil rights activist called Audre Lorde, who was also a poet and an author. And the quote I've often used is this one where she talks about self-care is an act of survival. Um, but today I want to use a different quote from her, um, which resonated greatly with me uh, in this last week as we've been seeing the transition or plans for the recovery and transition unfold. And she says this. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. And I think that resonated greatly with me because I still think that there is still great uh, trepidation and fear for us as we knew the inevitability of returning to our workplaces was imminent. Um, but that imposed change, that inevitability of that return um, can create for us some fear, some anxieties, and as I say, some trepidation. Trepidation. However, I suppose the main theme throughout the session today is 
how we make the transition to our workplaces at a personal as well as a professional level will determine its impact on our well-being. So today, I just want to offer ideas and strategies to support you in your thinking about the transition and in the actual transition to your respective workplaces. Changes are having to take place and they are having to take place at some pace throughout this uh, easing out of the lockdown. But that is a phrase that resonates greatly with me. It is about easing out of the lockdown. lockdown. And more about that as we, we go through. Um, but I um, know that there are going to be those changes that are having to take place, such as what is social distancing really going to be like in our classrooms? And although physically we can socially distance and measure out two metres between desks and chairs, etc., what does that do to the humanisation of our classrooms and the comfort and the sense of nurture that we also want to bring into our different establishments? Now, I have used this, um, those of you who've seen me in, in sessions before, I often use this slide, but it has a new addition today. I think it is about developing a new relationship with work, but recognising it's about that new relationship with work during a time of recovery. And this idea of resilience as being that internal representation of an external circumstance needs to take account of the effects of the pandemic and the lockdown. And that new relationship with work is not necessarily without its pain, without its confu confusion and without its chaos. So um, there's no doubt that each of us uh, will have changed through the experience of lockdown. We might not even notice it just now, but in making our return to our workplaces, I would ask you to look for the changes within yourself and look for the changes within yourself and how you are relating to this new context that you're finding yourself and notice their impact. It might be, for example, that externally, our expectations are having to change. Our expectations about parental communication, what that will look like, the frequency of that, as well as the expectation about what our children need as we consider their return to schools and early year settings and our colleges as well. And also that internal um, representation. Has your mission changed? Have your thoughts, feelings, your beliefs about the education that we need to provide right now, have they changed also? So just keep in mind throughout the session that idea of a new relationship with work. And I also want to make this point because I appreciate that I'm speaking to a wide range of practitioners just now who have all had their own experience of lockdown. And therefore, what are we each recovering from right, as we move forward? There's a lot of emphasis just now in the strategic recovery frameworks, the papers that are coming from the Scottish Government, from Education Scotland, about re recovery and reconnection. But one person's recovery will not be the same as another person's recovery. It may be that for some of us, recovery is about coming back into connection with others because we've lost that and it's had a huge impact on our well-being. Maybe it's about getting back into a routine, into a purpose that will help us. Equally, for others, it could be I'm having to leave the bubble and safety of my home to come into work uh, and that is causing me some anxiety. So the recovery might not be the recovery from lockdown. The recovery may be ongoing and there may be phases of recovery as we move forward into August, September and so on and so forth. What I've done here is that I've used a kind of similar idea to Maslow's hierarchy in thinking about what are the different losses we may have experienced and at what kind of level in relation to us as humans. So is it loss of connection? I know that I've been in lockdown on my own the whole time and therefore, you know, meeting people face to face, you know, I'm really looking forward to that. I also appreciate that others might feel there's been a real loss of learning um, and not being able to contact those individual pupils who need it more than ever before. Um, and also something to consider is this loss of previous ambition. The goals that we had in our school improvement plans, for example, in August, those goals, they may need to be re-examined and reset, or they may have gone forever completely because they're no longer relevant, or they're certainly not relevant to your period of recovery. But it's also good to, or important, I think, to recognise that any sense of loss that we have comes from a place of attachment. And therefore, what is that attachment to and how does that continue to serve us? What is the cost of our attachments? 
are there attachments that will continue to serve us or are there perhaps attachments say to previous goals and ambitions that no longer support us and that we now need to release Claire you, you, you previously mentioned in your dealing with uncertainty webinar um, mm -hmm. the tool about of self-compassion of perhaps asking what your best friend would say about this for you so you're taking more of an objective lens to it and I think that's a really useful thing to to come back to at this point rather than being so immersed sometimes it's good to sort of step back and look at it more pragmatically rather than being so um, emotionally involved in, in, in mm -hmm. this I think that's helpful because I think there's also something about our emotional attachment to behaviours and habits we had before, particularly the one of being critical of ourselves if we're not doing enough yeah. or we've not done enough to make up the loss of learning or we've not done enough to give ourselves a sense of that purpose. Whereas, in fact, we've just had to go into a bit of survival, try to thrive as best we can and strive on those really good days when we feel resourced to do that. So, yeah, I would uh, welcome that idea of having the voice of the best friend coming in to support you in looking at what those attachments are and what you need right now because maybe you don't have to bring back those habits and those ideas from the past thanks very much and i suppose with that idea of loss there's also that emptiness that if those goals have gone from before or that learning's gone from before then what now um, and I, I was reading a book a couple of years ago now called the untethered soul by Michael E. Singer, but there was a phrase in it that really um, gripped me or, or caught my attention. And it was this, it was the letting go of false solidity. And it really re resonated with me because it made me think just now about what are we going to do to fill that vacuum that may have been created? And what are we going to build now? And what foundation are we going to use to build it on? And I would say at this stage, you know, just to be cautious with that, because Whatever we are building during recovery may be subject to that impermanence. What we need for recovery isn't necessarily what we need for later down the line. So again, it's about thinking about, sorry, again, about thinking about lots of repetition, uh, thinking about um, what is a realistic and purposeful and supportive foundation just now, knowing that whatever, we're go whatever steps we are taking just now won't be forever. And that impermanence is actually the norm. You know, if we want to get really controversial about it, Sharon, we can think about impermanence is actually the permanent state of education because we are always changing and losing things and building again. This so, just seems a bit more acute for us and a bit more, you know, maybe out of our comfort zone more than ever before. But I think there is something about, you know, being responsive uh, and being reflective maybe about accepting that impermanence as the norm and, and i suppose i also want to i want to tell a quick um, story just now a quick example of something that's really struck me during this time of lockdown um, and a friend has given me full permission to share this story so if she listens in later and um, she knows who she is um, but a friend of mine has decided to um and our head teacher knows about this as well just to be really clear but uh, this friend has decided to take on a new job um, and during this time of lockdown, although she's worked at this school that she loves with all her heart and has put so much time and energy and a, a great love and passion into for many, many years, she's decided it's time now to move on during a time when everything is in flux and everything is in you know, what could be perceived as chaos. But she's decided this is the right time. So from going from a very solid foundation, she's now making a move to a new school come the summer. And you think to yourself, my goodness, you know, what a time to, to let go of that permanent foundation. But how permanent are these things? And therefore, by letting go, by allowing yourself to grow, by embracing that uncertainty as a new opportunity, um, it really reminds us all that although the fear is high, and it certainly is high in my friend right now, but her vision of service is permanent. And that's the foundation she uses to build upon. And it far outweighs the fear that she has in making that move. So I just wanted to share that kind of story as well. It's also a good example that fear can also be a positive driver and not always a negative entity. Yeah, well, my understanding is that there are two kind of main drivers in, in, in human nature and fear is one of them and pleasure is the other. Um, and I think at the moment we might be going 
um, vacillating between the two, which is fear and love or joy or, or, or excitement at the idea of reconnecting with our pupils and building something new and going back to that. But we, there will be an awful lot of vacillation as we go through this time. But sometimes that fear can be a bit of a catalyst to um, move us to a place that uh, feels better. Um, and it's just, again, a recognition that our feelings don't stay the same. They can move. Um, I think it is important as well though, to recognise those feelings and to acknowledge the feelings. And the one I want to look at just now, just briefly, is grief. And that, in fact, our grief can be transformative. And that sounds like a really difficult to think, thing to say, especially when people perhaps have lost jobs, have lost loved ones. It's a very difficult thing to say right now. And I do say that with great awareness and sensitivity um, around some of that. But I suppose the grief I'm talking about here does relate to the workplace just now um, and about our settings that we are going uh, back to. Um, and I, I suppose I want to give an example again of when something is imposed and the opportunities it affords you and also the opportunities that can be missed. And therefore that grief isn't always transformed in the best way that you would like and it doesn't shift in the emotions in a good way. And unfortunately and sadly and um, and this is an example from my own experience of my first leadership post. Um, and at the time I came in shiny new to my first leadership post, wanting to move forward and bring great ideas. And if I had my time again, um, I would acknowledge, I would acknowledge the grief that the staff were experienced in what had been before and in who had been there before. And I was taken on a leadership post of someone who'd been in post for over 17 years. And what I didn't do was to acknowledge their legacy, what had happened, the experiences staff had gone through, just losing that very important person who turned up for 17 years of their life in doing some great works and working so well with the, the school community. Um, so I think it's important that we make time when we first collect together to acknowledge that there's grief and to create a space that is safe, compassionate, uh, and, and the understanding of what each of us may be going through. So I suppose I am appealing to leaders out there today on this webinar um, to, to support staff with some of this, but knowing that perhaps that's the first step. And Claire, I think, I think, oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, I think, I think what's important as well is that grief will be different. It's not hmm. solely about maybe having lost a, a, a family member or heaven forbid, you know, in, a people or or whatever the situation of grief may be but actually the grief of that previous life that they've had in school I've seen lots of comments on Twitter this this week of teachers mm -hmm. seeing freeze boards as they were half drunk cups of coffee li lying still and these kind of things of almost like a, a life being and gone and and every time you open a, do, a different drawer and see something a child a previous child in a class a previous class had given you there will all, they will be little pockets of grief that revisit all the time so it's not just one type of grief we're going to experience it's a very good point and and i suppose as well there's a there's a danger that we formalize a weekly meeting to talk about our feelings when in fact i open a drawer on a wednesday and I can't talk about it till the Friday because that's when we have our weekly meeting. Yeah. So, so it has to be very human. It has to be very natural. And therefore, it's about the kind of mindset and behaviours that we all bring, um, whether we're leaders or not, to our school environment, to our school team, in recognising that we are there for one another, um, no matter what comes up for us, no matter the coffee cup or the item in the drawer that brings back the memory of the class we've just had to say goodbye to maybe we won't see you again so no thanks thanks for doing that and i think i think only then when we acknowledge that grief and acknowledge the loss even if it's just a you know quick going into my neighbor's room to say oh, i found this remember jason gave me this and i was having a tough time with him and you know and we maybe get emotional it's only then that we can now allow those emotions to move through us and give ourselves the energy and the impetus to create the meaningful experiences for the classes yet to come for the children coming in excuse me and to consider what our collegiate expectations are what those new expectations are and then collegiately how we are responding I think there's also something here as well just to say and I'll, I'll mention more about this as we go through but what energy and time am I putting uh, putting into this um, because the recovery is going to be impermanent we'll get to a place where we do feel a lot better and we can move forward and for some schools that may take longer uh, than others 
And so again, just recognizing for myself and my own well-being, you know, if I'm being asked to plan certain things, how much energy and time do I need to get this done? And 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 is it going to change next week? And if so, why are we doing this? Uh, and I think it is, is a time for those healthy discussions about what it is we need to focus on, even from week to week. Because even the First Minister is saying the 11th of August is what we're aiming for. But we don't know yet until the science is telling us it is safe to do so. There are also the new opportunities then that can come from this. Um, and we might find that even during our experiences of lockdown, there's been the inertia that hit us initially where we thought, oh, how do I get myself moving? I'm, I'm at working from home. It's so difficult. And now we might have found ourselves into a better routine with that and adapted pretty well. But now it's a case of that inertia reaching us again, we think going back to a workplace where things were just left over a weekend. That was the reality. And it's allowing and easing ourselves to gather the momentum that will need to carry us forward. And therefore to think about as I go along, what still needs to be kept with my work-life balance? And um, what is my mission in the next week, in the next few days, in the next couple of hours, what's my mission? Um, and how does this contribute to, to who I am? And who am I now that is noticing what's happening as opposed to who I was before? So just some things to consider. Sorry, as we go. Just, as just as you're talking there, I hadn't really thought about the wasted energy we potentially could be mm. losing as a result of worrying about things that actually aren't important now. And that's <laughs> something to be really mindful of, isn't it? And I saw something that was on Twitter, um, and please forgive me, I cannot remember the source, but they talked about part of the recovery is regression. Um, yeah. that as, as we kind of recollect, I would say ourselves, uh, we're also maybe on a bit of a back foot emotionally. So I think it's important to recognise that I can't keep putting all of my energy in planning so far forward, when in fact I'm still trying to find my, my foothold for getting into the next step or the next day's work. So just being gentle, self-compassionate, really important just now. Yeah. And, Can and I also I just... Sorry. Yeah, please. Okay. I just wanted to um, let um, our listeners know that one of our partners, Hugh Smith, is actually doing a think piece. It's been released on Monday on grief and loss specifically okay. and how teachers can help manage that for themselves and for others within school. So a, a good piece to look out for. That's terrific. No, thank you. Um, coaches should never assume, so please forgive me, I'm being a terrible coach today, but I suppose these are um, my reflections, if not assumptions. Um, and what I've been reflecting on and recognising is that we don't have all of the answers. We have some of the answers. No one person, not even the First Minister, God bless her, has all of the answers. But here's the thing, I don't believe we've ever had all of the answers. Um, and I know that this can cause stress. Um, uncertainty causes stress when we don't have those answers. But I suppose what it also provides in making some of these assumptions or recognising these as maybe a helpful foundation to move forward from is that there's reassurance that we are all in this together and we're all operating from that same place. Some leaders may feel pressure to have all the answers, to be the experts, because they want to reassure staff. But this is a time when leaders may have to say to staff, I just don't know that yet, or I just don't know. Um, but this, you know, with every day, we're learning more. Um, and it's recognising that we are edging towards more of, of, of a better picture about things. I suppose as well, you know, we talk a lot in education in these recent times about empowerment. I think if there were ever uh, a time to truly embrace empowerment in a way that is real and meaningful and, and about myself, then I think it is now about how I look after myself, how I support myself, and um, how I become that creator that I spoke about before in that last webinar, and not get myself into a place of feeling that I'm the victim and that I need a rescuer, that in fact I need some questions, I need a bit of coaching, I need some challenges, but I also can create some opportunities and some answers for myself. And I think when we're having that anxiety and to get a handle on some of this, we can perhaps focus on what we do know and what we don't know yet. And that's the point I'm making about, yeah, there are certain things we don't know yet. And it's not until the days unfold that we have a kind of fuller experience of that. 
I compare it to that kind of idea of um, the Jack Canfield story where he talks about the headlights and the journey ahead. We might have a destination, but we've never been there. No one has ever been to the future. We don't have a destination, but we've kind of got a, an idea of where it may be. And we set off in our cars with some sort of roadmap, but the headlights are only showing us the next kind of 10 yards in front of us, 100 yards in front of us. And therefore, um, we have to trust a bit of that journey and trust that maybe that's all we need ahead of us. So when I've been looking at the strategic recovery framework, I've been looking at this kind of idea about what we do know. And one of the things that really struck me was this idea of the guiding principles for return. Things that are safe, fair and ethical, clear, realistic, and that there are always going to be those balances and those trade-offs that sometimes we are we feel um, anxious about kind of the safety of the school environment, that's going to have to take precedence over um, perhaps what is uh, realistic or what is fair. Or, you know, so there are going to be these trade-offs as perhaps we go along. But recognising that within those guiding principles, we can also apply those to our own well-being. So, for example, you know, what is realistic in terms of what we are planning for right now? Um, what is it to be physically safe? Um, and also, what is physically possible? I may know what I would like to do for pupils. I may know what I might like to do for families. But in terms of the hours that we have in a week physically, what are the realistic possibilities with some of this? Um, so just checking in with ourselves. And also this idea just now of being busy and being productive. Those of you who've heard me before, you know I'm all about the impact. Let's get to the core of things. Let's get to what is making the difference, not, not focusing on what is not. And therefore, what is it for me just now to be productive? It might be that my first day back on Monday is my productivity is about, you know, setting up desks. That's all I can get done on a particular day to start to, to recognise stuff I don't know, which is in the next column, about what it will feel like, what it will start to look like. Uh, and if it starts to feel a bit empty, how do I make this more of a human environment, a more nurturing environment, as safely as I possibly can for the pupils I have coming in? I know as well that um, parental communication is going to be high on the agenda. It was something that the Education um, and Skills Committee were talking about on the 5th of June. And therefore, if that's going to be a new focus for workload, what we'll have to give? Because we can't do it all. And in recovery, again, back to this idea of what needs to be done that's productive, has impact and is the essential work. I was also seeing something as well uh, in a, a TESS article by Lynn Binney, who's a principal psychologist in East Lothian. And she was talking about in TESS, I think it was just out yesterday, um, about it's not about catching up for our pupils, it's about that reconnection. So that's the focus of the workload. What does that mean? Um, as, I, as I've mentioned then, you know, I've been listening to the Education and Skills Committee, but I've also been watching other informative programmes, Sharon, such as Newsnight. Uh, and uh, people might think that's quite rather dubious with old Emily Maitlis coming out with rather controversial statements. But uh, a very uncontroversial programme I watched on, regarding Newsnight was uh, a section with Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of, former Archbishop of Canterbury and theologian, and he talked about this idea of my well-being is wrapped up in your well-being and yours in mine. Um, and I think it's never so true for ourselves in schools right now that as team members, we really are all in this together. And therefore, the consistency across schools may just not be possible. And therefore, it is a waste of our time and energy looking down the road or up the road to see what our neighbouring schools are doing just now. Sure, we can learn some aspects from them. That's helpful. But we might not always be able to use exactly the same context. So again, it's thinking about even um, you know, within our schools, what does safe, fair and ethical, clear and realistic mean for us as a staff? And I know as well just now, there'll be conversations and acknowledgements that even within school staff, there is a lack of consistency in terms of the roles that people are maybe having to take on just now. And sometimes the fairness can perhaps be perceived or feel to be quite different. I know that's a very controversial thing to raise just now, but I do want to acknowledge it because I can see it, I can hear it, I can feel it for some people. And I think it's important to bring it to light. 
Because I think when we don't bring these issues to light, when people feel the way that they feel and totally understandably, it festers and becomes something greater. And I think what tends to happen with people is that they can, all of us people, you know, all of us, um, when we feel stressed and we have that stress response going on, we engage in different behaviours for our own self-protection. It's quite natural to do that. And therefore, there are maybe some avoidance behaviours we get into where we just isolate ourselves further and further because we're just feeling so frustrated. There also maybe are some safety behaviours that we take on where it's become, we become very defensive because we're not able to articulate what it is that's really bugging us because we know we're in it together, but it's really difficult to be in it together when in fact, I can see some inconsistencies and lack of fairness. So again, it's about recognising what is workload and what is my workload and what does it mean for me? It might be that in upper stages in a primary school or indeed in different subject areas in a secondary school, we might perceive that other colleagues are not uh, working on as much content as maybe we are working. But perhaps what we don't know about those individual members of staff is that they are taking on different roles within the school community in order to, to support and work in different ways. So I think a lack of assumption and a greater opportunity to work together and have greater transparency about who is doing what they are doing um, can be very helpful. So therefore, I think it's essential to notice how we're feeling and it's essential as well to talk about it openly as a group um, and share just the experiences that we're having. But also recognising that if I do feel I could do, be doing more, that we want to offer our services in different ways. And here are a couple of examples that I've been hearing about. I've been hearing about teachers who are on non-class contact thing, saying that they want to develop much more um, content um, from home. Um, people, teachers who are shielding, want to, to do uh, more of that, take on more of that role and support those practitioners who are in schools or in earlier settings. And um, I'm also hearing about a member of staff who's working now with schools, uh, with families rather, and has been given that role because she's been doing it through lockdown and it makes sense for her to continue in that way. And therefore her colleagues are going to take on different um, roles in her place within the school setting. So it's about being creative with some of our opportunities. Claire, I think what's really important, well, Every teacher will have their own agenda when they go back into school, but it, it's very right what you say. We're all wrapped up in each other's well-being, but I think what we have to be really mindful of is decisions are being made by our school leaders with the best intentions when no one is an expert just now. And yeah. so therefore, some people might think some decisions are not fair compared with other other asks from other people. And I, I think the the you know you, we spoke about being empowered and and being solution we really need to be solution focused and if we do have a response we do have something to say this is not a time for culture of blame this is a time of culture of support and to be solution for focused and to really work together to actually do what we've got to do and get through what we've got to get through having been a class teacher and a head teacher i recognize the need for me as a head teacher to be so transparent about what I can be transparent about um, and to offer that support in the best way that I possibly can. And as a class teacher, I also have an understanding that my head teacher does have an overview of other priorities that I just don't, I, I, I haven't borne witness to. And therefore the trust, and I'll, I'll come on to that a little bit later, but the trust uh, is going to be essential. Um, and that's where it's challenging, where in fact, um, you know, it's it's um it's coming at some pace some of those decisions that leaders are having to make so it is about having that trust that patience and that compassion um with one another in the best way that we can and just on that note regarding the stress that we may be experiencing as individuals i think you know just recognizing what are my triggers and where do i go to regarding my own safety behaviors self-protective behaviors avoidance behaviors um, I might, you know, come out with a phrase at one time with a colleague or with a manager to say, well, that's not fair. But actually, it's not the fairness that's the issue for me. There might be something deeper where it's anxiety that I maybe feel not safe about being put in a situation. And it's not about the fairness. So it's important to check in, first of all, with ourselves to think, well, what's really going on for me here? And just bringing in that self-awareness so that we can properly articulate what may go on for us. That idea of starting with the end in mind, I appreciate that's going to be quite difficult. But even if starting with the end in mind is a daily process, 
where what do I expect to, to achieve by the end of today might be more helpful in, as opposed to thinking what will I achieve by August or by the end of these summer holidays. So just thinking about what is, um, what is moderate, what is helpful um, and proportionate and what it is I can do for myself. That idea of reducing the external load, that's the idea of relationship with work, the external. I would suggest that you start with the small stuff because that's always the stuff that breaks the camel's back. So if something is niggling, you just say it's an external thing, share it with someone, go to someone who can listen or at least um, help you find a solution to some of that. And with some of that internal load, I'll speak a little bit more, remind ourselves of some of the strategies I've spoken about before. But with that internal load, um, just finding a way to reduce the intensity of the emotions that we have. Um, and I'm going to speak about that a bit later. And definitely taking care of the three R's, especially I would add in the four R's, which is, which is recovery. When we're in recovery, we'll need to rest, we'll need the recreation and we'll need the relationships more than ever. And we're going to need those relationships of trust in our schools with our team members um, as much as we possibly can to support us at this time. It's difficult, as I said, to start with the end in mind. And none of us have, as I said earlier, have never, none of us have ever been to the future, rather. Um, and Michael Neal in his book, Creating the Impossible, Michael Neal's a coach, and um, he talks about this idea that the mind is a virtual reality generator, that it's generating for us many, many different options of what that future is going to look like. And some of it is really helpful because we can envision and we can be productive and think about opportunities. Sadly, um, some of the time <laughs> it can create futures we'd rather not think about or see. But of course, that comes from a tendency to want to protect ourselves. And if the worst happens, have I thought about it? I, I understand that. And again, something I've spoken about before in, in, in previous webinars. Um, but I, again, kind of support us with some of this, thinking about that journey to the future is perhaps again preparing for that journey of recovery. Um, and it's about that one step at a time. But it's also recognising that what I need for the journey, I don't need for the destination. So I'm going to start to develop maybe new ways of thinking, new habits, and I've got to decide what do I want to keep a hold of and perhaps what do I want to let go of as I move forward. And the other thing as well is that you know each day with each experience, we're finding out about what it is that we do need and what we will continue to need on this journey of recovery. And therefore, I'd ask us to, to consider us operating from a place of curiosity and becoming an explorer, as Michael Neal talks about in Creating the Impossible, and perhaps not becoming the expert. It's not about being the expert with the answers. It's about exploring, becoming an explorer and exploring this together. So therefore, when we are having the 3 a.m. in the morning wake up calls, of worry and absolute um, uh, fear, a uh, stricken fear of what lies ahead, recognising that that virtual reality generator is at work and maybe finding a piece of paper and just the offload um, what we need that evening or for the next day, uh, sorry, not evening, that morning or for the next day to allow us to get back to a place of rest. Because the other thing is, and one of his mentors said this to him, we will never know this little again. As every day passes and with every experience we have of even going back to work and um, we'll never know this little again. So just uh, some things for us to consider about that idea. Of well, I like, the, I like to think of us all now as early years children, nursery children, and we're oh, learning yeah. to and exploration. That, that, that puts a smile on my face. I think that's just... Yeah. I think it is because I think we will try out things that don't work uh, and we'll recognise it. And we might not know they won't work until August, until we're underway. Uh, and therefore, it's about communicating that message to parents as well, that we're in a time of exploration uh, and we're not the experts on certain things, but our expertise does lie with caring for the, our children and keeping them safe uh, and allowing them to reconnect. And I think that's the same message yeah. that the government has given all the time, that they're making the best decisions with the best information that they have, but they'll never be, the hindsight might tell a different story, but at, at the time, we're doing everything with a caring and, and, and thoughtful um, purpose and motive to what we're It's about that idea, isn't it, of that um, idea of intentionality. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 
um, sewn together with the best of intentions. <laughs> um, okay. I heard something this morning, I can't remember whose quote it is, please forgive me, but something about, um, I'm full of flaws. That's what it is, I'm full of flaws, but I'm sewn together with the best of intentions. And I thought that was a great phrase. I, I resonate greatly with that. And that's where we are at the moment. And I think that's something that we have to embrace, that if we do mm -hmm. have something wrong, it's not been because we've, we've sought to do something wrong. We've done yes. Everything we've done is with the best intentions. Yeah. And, and here's a, a paper uh, what I'd like to share with you just now. I read this a, a number of years ago, and um, it doesn't make for very comfortable reading in its context in 2013. And it's an American uh, paper written by uh, a researcher uh, about um, the US education system is a critique of the US education system. I'm not here to make any comments on that today. Um, but this analogy of Sisyphus, um, where Sisyphus is rolling the boulder um, up the mountain. Now Sisyphus, those of you with a, a Greek mythological uh, knowledge, which I don't have a great knowledge of, but I remember this story from the past. Sisyphus was banished by the Greek gods for some misdemeanor. Um, and he was banished to a life of rolling a boulder to the top of a mountain and it coming back down the hill again. Now, I want to use this metaphor lightly just now, but I do want to make reference to this idea that in this paper and also perhaps in our, our own feelings, making the connection with our own feelings and our own circumstances, sometimes we can face a mountain and be rolling up different kinds of boulders only to find those boulders rolling back down and having no impetus and making no difference whatsoever. But people don't mention the mountain, is what Hess says, that in fact, sometimes that mountain ought to be. Now, the mountain we have just now, and this is where his analogy and my analogy, we part ways. We really do have a mountain. It is true we do have a mountain, not just to make the recovery, but also to consider excellence and equity and what that is for us all. Um, and what that closing the gap or interrupting the poverty cycles or whichever um, phrase that we have been versed in to support us and trying to support those children who we know are going to be further behind now with their education and um, therefore you know what are the boulders that we are wanting to roll up this massive mountain that are actually going to make the difference unlike Sisyphus because I think we can make a difference and Fulan and Hargreaves in their work over 25 years ago now in what's worth fighting for I'd like to paraphrase their book now and say, you know, what's worth rolling up a mountain uh, now that will bring us all, you know, impact, success and support for our well-being? It's a rather lengthy title. I'll maybe not write the book just yet. But there is something about how will our own recovery policies and plans within our schools, will it support us and account for our well-being? Um, and I think it's maybe about, and I'm moving away from the Sisyphus uh, idea now, but it's maybe about what if our boulders were more meaningful and more purposeful? And um, what if we could really roll up the right boulders just now in order to start to make a great way further up the mountain of that ex excellence and equity where we might have felt those boulders have rolled back down? And I think it is about, you know, knowing what the right boulders are at the right time. And these are our boulders just now, some of the things I've, I've listed there on the left. But I, I also think that, you know, your your well-being is part of this process too um, and what you realize through lockdown uh, about the needs for your own well-being in order to begin to move boulders up big mountains um, are certain things that you just can't afford now to give up um, and this is a tool from Alec McFedrin um, and Alec McFedrin uh, uses something called the genius model you can see the acronym down the side there goals energy nurture etc the first letters make the acronym genius. And in this genius model, he talks about what is realistic for us. And that might be our genius plan might be what's realistic for me as I make my way back to my workplace. It might be that I haven't had a journey to make um, in, in during the lockdown. And that has saved me time and therefore I can put it into more physical exercise. But now I have to make that journey, but I can't afford to let that physical exercise go. So what can I do? What are the opportunities? Making that realistic. And I like this model because I think more than ever when we're talking about recovery, we need to focus on energy and nurture for ourselves. So what is worth investing in with that particular goal that I set myself? Um, and what do I need to feel good? Um, we don't have all the answers, nope, but we have the wisdom 
from our lockdown experience to perhaps guide us towards a place now that's going to support us more with what we can do, what we want to do and what we know is right for us. Um, so just some, some thoughts there as well about energy and nurture for ourselves. And I think these are key questions as well about this idea of productivity. If I'm going to create a well-being plan for myself, or indeed that, that genius model can be used for your work plan in terms of what goals are realistic now, there are key questions I would ask here. And, and it's this, or the first, or the sole key question for me really is, what is the essential work now? What is the essential work today, tomorrow, next week, or even this week? Um, and how do I assess that every single week to say, right, where am I now? What is still the core work? And not get caught up in some of those other distractions that we know we would like to do, but aren't realistic and aren't really going to bring us the productivity and impact that we need at this particular time. Um, so just some thoughts there about what I can drop. Um, because, And I've asked this question before in previous sessions, and it was very difficult prior to lockdown for people to consider, well, I can't drop anything. But we went into lockdown and we had to drop a lot of things. So what do we now need to pick up? And what other things do we just let, let lie for a while or let lie completely? Um, and maybe this is a time. I, I saw a great thing again on Twitter. Isn't Twitter fabulous for so much uh, <laughs> of our source? But, um, but some uh, great educator was speaking about, well, if we're doing blended learning, what will homework be now? <laughs> um, so again, just thinking about our possibilities and um, some ideas around that. So um, back to that idea of trust and this idea of professional trust. Again, another paper um, that I came across a while back uh, from the University of Cambridge by Roe on professional trust. And Roe talks about this idea that trust is essential in us being professionals and being trusted by others, trusted by colleagues, trusted by our children and young people, and trusted by our families and our parents, as well as other colleagues in the wider community. But trust involves risk. Um, and and Ro talks about this idea that professional trust is built upon legal and moral legitimacy, and that that professional trust then um, involves an aspect of my own judgment that that legal legitimacy is based on maybe the impersonal, the curriculum that we use, the pedagogies that we've chosen. And parents expect that from us and colleagues may expect that from us. But regarding my judgment, there's a moral legitimacy with that, which is based on my wisdom, my experiences, my set of values and beliefs and my expectations. Uh, and therefore, there's um, a way in which perhaps some of our leaders just now are taking forward the transitions to, to, to come back to our workplaces. And here's an example where a head teacher one might focus on parental expectations within her school because she knows and the colleagues in her school know that this is imperative that we get this right. And if we get this part right, then other things will follow. Head teacher two down the road in another school is thinking we need to focus on that nurturing environment. Children in this school and families in this school need to know that this place is nurturing and that's what we're going to focus on now. It's not that head teacher two doesn't value focusing on parental expectations. It's just that head teacher two makes that the priority. Head teacher three, however, although knows parental expectations and a nurturing environment are important, decides to focus on staff well-being as the starting point. My question here and what Ro asks as well is, who's wrong? Who's right? And I suppose the answer is, it's about going beyond the right and wrong of this. It's about the trust that leaders do have that overview, that we do have those professional relationships built on trust that can support us at this particular time. So just keeping this in mind as well. I talked there as well about trust and I talked about this idea that we do have to put our trust in one another and sometimes that trust comes with vulnerabilities. Um, we can feel emotionally out at sea and I just want to um, remind ourselves of previous webinars where I've asked us to consider when we feel stuck or we feel overwhelmed, consider the FISB. If I'm feeling overwhelmed just now, where is my focus? Where am I sat or where am I standing? What is it that's, that's, that's um, caught my focus just now? 
And in terms of our inner state, how is it making me feel? And how is it manifesting in some of my behaviours? And how can I shift that focus? Is it going for a walk? Is it going to speak to someone? Is it putting on some music? How do I shift that focus? And again, in an earlier webinar, I talked about this idea of finding ways to soothe myself. At the moment, we're going to be very focused on driving and preparing and putting things in place. We're also going to feel that threat system kicking in, but we feel a little bit unsure, unsafe about some aspects of the work that we might be having to do, or just anxious about the workload, the immensity of it all. But we're not just two systems, we're three systems, and we need to find ways to soothe ourselves with ways we know and have helped us during lockdown. And I heard this quote, you know, we're never a thought away from being unstuck. <laughs> we're never a thought away from feeling better. So just keeping those in mind. And on that note, we're going to move to a poll now, as I understand, that asks some questions about how you're feeling. So I'll hand over to you just now, Sharon. I just launched that poll for you there, Sharon. So that's now appearing on your screen. I'll just give people around about a minute to respond to that. Thank you, Fraser. I think looking at the, t at the time that we have, we may not have time to go to questions, Claire, but um, oh, as always, I uh, will share them with you. And if you'd be good enough to respond, we can share Certainly. them with our listeners, your answers with yeah. listeners. My apologies. I didn't plan it that way, Sharon, I promise. <laughs> I know. Um, it's just, I just feel there's a, there is a lot of content today and I appreciate it. I want to support in the best way possible. Absolutely. I'm always trying to fit so much in. I'll just give people another 10 seconds or so to respond and then I'll close the poll. I'll just share the results now. So we're looking at 32% uh, have excitement at being in a routine and seeing pupils and their colleagues. 30% yeah, with overwhelm at starting over again. 19% mm. uh, with exhaustion at having to think about new routines. 14% mm. yeah. with enthusiasm at doing work differently and seeing pupils. And 5% with anxiety about not feeling safe. Yes. Thank you. Just trying to move the slides on just now. Lovely. Thank you so much. There's the poll there. I fully appreciate um, your responses there. Thank you so much. And it, it, listening to the numbers there and doing the quick maths, over 50% certainly of people feeling uh, that kind of overwhelm or that kind of anxiety um, and just the kind of exhaustion, which is completely understandable. And that's why I said earlier about the ease, you know, the easing out of lockdown, that we do have to be more gentle with ourselves um, as best we can. And therefore, checking in with our line managers, checking in with one another to say, this is how I'm feeling. I will get there. I will get up and running, uh, but I maybe need to make you aware that I'm not there yet. That might take a bit of pressure off ourselves. And I suppose, um, I know I don't have the, all the answers for individuals just now. I never have done, and, and people I'm sure are very aware of that. But I do want to acknowledge those feelings, and I acknowledge some of those feelings in this particular um, slide just now because there is that kind of inertia and that sense of gosh I've got to pick myself up again at the end of a very busy year because let's face it we're locking down in a very busy term towards the end of that and many of us will have not have experienced those kind of um, uh, Easter holidays at all we've not had that break since perhaps Christmas and um, so that's been a long time and even over this summer I know there'll be preparations and a whole host of things happening but I do want to share this idea of just the acknowledgement we don't always have the answers but we do have those feelings and i want to offer um this opportunity to share a, a model with you where it's not about overthinking stuff it's just about feeling it and letting it go and letting it move and, and morph into something else when i try to overthink it sometimes i create more of that energy around it that i don't need um, and in coaching sessions i've often find myself I often find myself just allowing coaches 
to express what they're they're feeling. And I came across a tool from the coaching tool company, and they use um, the three A's, so that kind of awareness about what are you feeling right now, and what else is coming up. Because sometimes what we think we are feeling is actually related to something else. So that what else question is invaluable. Just acknowledging where that is in our bodies, where we feel it, what it's like, and just having a compassionate, supportive, non-judgmental, comforting presence of a colleague or a family member to allow us to just express that and welcome those feelings up. Because um, those feelings we feel very much, not just in our minds, but in our bodies. Um, and allowing ourselves a cry, a shout of anger, a pummeling of pillows, whatever it is that we're needing just now, just allowing that to flow. What is lovely to hear is the um, also the respondents who are excited, who are enthusiastic. And I think it's also good to recognise not to judge ourselves if we're not feeling that. You know, that may come, it just might take a little bit longer for that to come. Um, and we can't really feel it until we see it, until we see it in August. That's okay too. And as always, I'm on hand for anyone who wants to get in touch for 20 minutes, half an hour, just to chat through anything. And there are helplines um, that come up at the end. So just recognising that, that those emotions, they come up in our, in our bodies and not just in our minds. And a major theme that's going to come up for us is that recovery and that reconnection. Um, I know it's, um, it's been a real theme in the last uh, number of weeks. But isn't it interesting that even during lockdown, we were already reconnecting. We were reconnecting with what mattered most to us. The amount of people I've spoken to said, I really realise now I need to spend more time at home or with my family or reconnecting with my loved ones. I can't let this go. I need to make sure I carry this forward. And I would say that during recovery, we're still going to need that. We're still going to need those, those connections and connections, reconnections with our passions as well. And as we move forward, I think it's also about recognising that that underpins, and that's why it's central here in this slide, all of those connections, family connections, pastimes, friendships, they connect with who we really are. And it's from there, that place, from a mind-heart connection that we can truly connect with our children, our communities, our responsibilities. And there's a book uh, by um, a professor, Michael Puet and Christine gross Lowe called the path and it, it's about Chinese philosophy, ancient Chinese philosophy and they use this idea of the mind heart in making connections with our learning and how we move forward within our lives and I think it's that mind heart connection that we're going to need in order to support our pupils. As Lynn Binney spoke about in her test article, it's not about the catch up. So if we're being focused on the learning and the catch up as a practitioner for many years, this is where we're going to have to bring our own mind heart uh, into place and focus on the nurture, our own wisdom and the compassion that we need in order to support our pupils and move forward. So just as a kind of reflection tool, and this will be available as from tomorrow, as I understand, just asking ourselves one of these questions. Um, key for me is this really, you know, what do I know, sorry, what do I now believe that my learners need and what can I realistically provide now? I think that's key in terms of balance of my own well-being and also my renewed mission as I proceed. And just to finish with a quote, if I may, Bill George, who is a lecturer, uh, a fellow at Harvard, the Harvard Business School, he talks in his book about authentic leadership. And one of the quotes that I have from him is this, that industry has gone from the efficient use of people's hands to the use of people's brains in the 20th century, but success in the 21st century will require the efficient use of people's hearts. And I believe that that's how we will find our true reconnection as we move forward with ourselves and our own well-being and that for our children and our young people in our schools. So thanks very much for your time today. As always, I'll be available for questions and support as will these helplines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. As I said before, we've run out of question, question time today, but we will Sorry. collate. No, absolutely. We will um, do as previously. We'll, we'll gather the questions and we'll send them to you for answers. Fraser, can I pass over to you? Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Sharon, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please contact communications at gtcs.org.uk. That's communications at gtcs.org.uk.
Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. As I mentioned previously, the materials from today's webinar will be available on our website in the Health and Wellbeing Hub by tomorrow afternoon. On behalf of GTC Scotland, Claire, Sharon, and myself, thank you for joining us today and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you.